It's wonderful to be back. Um, as I've talked to many of you, uh, the weather that I was in in Florida, uh, complete opposite of what I came back to. It was welcome back to Nebraska in a fierce way uh, with the snow and, and the cold. And, and I know even while we were gone, you endured even worse cold, uh, negative, uh, terrible negative temperatures. But it's so wonderful to be back. And uh, the Lord always uh, provides what we need to keep us warm, even in the midst of this kind of temperature. Uh, but I was so blessed to be able to go. And, and I, again, want to thank Bill for being willing to, uh, last week to come and, and preach. And I did a wonderful job, and, and we we're thankful for that. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk about, or we were going to go back to the book of Genesis. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we've, we've moved away from the book of Genesis just for a couple of weeks. But this week, we're going to go back to the book of Genesis. And we're in chapter 4. And, of course, we're talking here about Cain murdering Abel. And I want to read one verse, and we'll pray here. And it's right on, above my head here on the screen. Verse 8, it says, Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, you have been so good to us. Even this morning as we have prayed to you, as we have worshipped you, as we have thought about how great you are, how worthy you are of praise, we praise you again. We thank you for being God. And Lord, as I was just talking to the children about having a thankful heart, Lord, we are so thankful for your goodness, your grace, for giving us what we don't deserve, your love, your compassion. And Lord, we're thankful for your mercy, not giving us what we deserve, eternity separated from you. God, we love you, but our love is always tainted with sin. And so, Lord, we're asking you this morning to speak to us in spite of us, to speak through me in spite of the vile man that I am. I thank you, God, again for your compassion. We ask that your Holy Spirit continue to move in our presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. These verses here in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, they give us the account of Cain and Abel. Now, most people who have really never read the Bible, they know a little bit, at least this much. They know that Cain murdered his brother Abel. And when we say that those, uh, we even say this, we say that those who are misbehaving and usually misbehaving terribly, we call that raising Cain. But as we look at our passage this morning, this scripture before us, I want us to notice a few things from chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. The first thing that I want us to notice is the conception. I want us to notice Abel and Cain and their birth. So look at verses, uh, the first two verses. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. First two verses. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. Now remember that God had said to Adam and Eve in chapter 1, verse 28, I want you to go and be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So God has told them this in chapter 1. Now the incentive to have children, to populate the world, was enhanced by the promise, remember, of chapter 3, verse 15. And remember chapter 3, verse 15, this is right after Adam and Eve have disobeyed God and they have fallen, and God says to them that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So through Eve or the woman would come the Messiah. Adam and Eve have been barred from Eden's garden, and now they're located somewhere east of Eden. Verse 1 says that Eve conceived and she bore a son, Cain. Now, all of us parents remember, we remember the first child and, and their birth, and what hopes and dreams are wrapped up in that first baby, that first baby born to us. 
I'm sure Adam and Eve, they had big dreams for Cain. Eve's pregnancy, remember, would have been the first pregnancy on the earth. And it must have been a source of joy and wonder for this couple. Like millions of her daughters that follow, Eve likely placed Adam's hand on her tummy so that he could feel the stirring of life. Maybe Adam even placed his ear to Eve's tummy just so if maybe he could hear the faint heartbeat of this new life. But instead of filling their dreams, of fulfilling their dreams, the first baby broke their hearts and he left a trail of blood and tears in his wake. When Cain was born, Eve must have hoped that he was that long-awaited Christ. But the name Cain means, I've gotten or acquired a man from the Lord. Eve would have been a cold-blooded atheist if she had believed anything else. Her exclamation demonstrates her saving faith in the promise of a coming redeemer, redeemer. But she was wrong. Now Cain's name reminds us that all life comes from God. Eve bore a second son, and he was Abel. Now Abel means breath. And it's translated vanity 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. So his name signified a lack of permanence or meaning, and it alluded unwittingly to his life being cut short. His life will be brief. As his sons grew older, Adam put them to work in the fields, and it became evident that each of these sons, each boy had his own interest, he had his own skills, so Cain became a farmer, and Abel became a shepherd. Now next, I want you to notice the offering. So we know that these two boys are born, and we know that they have grown up, and we see here some offerings that Cain and Abel brought to God. Verses 3 through 7. Let's read those together. Verses 3 through 7. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Now, we don't know how old these boys are at this point, but they're old enough to have their own professions. Both of these boys are honorable, and they needed professions. Cain became a farmer, and Abel became a shepherd. This is not the first time, though, that these boys have come to worship God. No doubt, Adam and Eve had worshiped with their children. They had been to an altar and witnessed their own parents worshiping the Lord. God taught Adam and Eve the proper way to worship and why they were to offer a blood sacrifice. And even as God clothed Adam and Eve with the animal skins, remember that first animal killed to clothe Adam and Eve because they were naked, they recognized it because of their sin, he had taught them about sacrifices and the shedding of blood. And I believe that they would have passed this on, this truth on to their children. Now, for all of uh, Cain's faults, he was no atheist. For all of the faults that Cain had, he was no atheist. He came to worship. Both brothers came to worship. God accepted one brother's worship, and he rejected the other. Why would he do that? Why would God accept one brother's worship and not accept the other? Well, I believe because it does matter how we worship and what we bring before the Lord. It does matter what, how we worship and what we bring before the Lord. God is God, and He is worthy of our worship. He also has the right, because He is God, to tell us how we're to worship Him and how we're to not. We must worship God His way, and not the way that we want to worship Him. Abel's offering was accepted why was it accepted? Well, Abel came before God in faith. Hebrews 11.4 speaks of Abel coming before God in faith, and Cain did not. Abel believed God, and he offered the best he had. Cain lacked faith, 
And apparently, he just went through the motions. Now, notice that verse 4 says that God looked with regard. That means favor. He looked with favor on Abel in his offering. Now, the order here is crucial. The man first, first the man, then the offering. Did you notice that? I don't know if you've ever picked up on that. God looks on the man first and then his offering. Now, note verse 5. He did not look with regard or respect or favor on Cain and his offering. Again, the order is crucial. Looking at the man Cain and then looking at what he offered. So God always looks to the heart first and foremost. When he looked at Abel's heart, he saw faith. He saw righteousness there. And God rewarded his faith and righteousness. Cain's absence of faith guaranteed that his offering would be rejected. Sacrifice is acceptable to God only if it's offered in an acceptable spirit. Where there is no faith, even the finest offering cannot make up the difference. So Abel offered a blood sacrifice. Abel offered a blood sacrifice. And if you go to Hebrews 9, and you don't have to turn there right now, I'll read it to you. Hebrews 9, verse 22, it says, Without the shedding of blood... There is no remission of sins. So Abel offers a blood sacrifice. Cain does not. Moses makes it plain that Abel offered the best, the fat portions, the firstborn of his flock. It was the healthiest, the plumpest, and of the choicest portions. Abel brought the best he had to God. My question to us today is, are you? Are you bringing the best you have to God? Or are you just giving God the leftovers? Are you bringing the best to God of your finances? Do you say, okay, my finances, all this money's come into me today, and, and I'm going to make sure that I take care of myself, and, and that I've got all of my needs, and I've got all of my wants, and I, and I do everything I can do to make sure I spend it on myself, and then God gets what's left over. Is God getting the leftovers, or is he getting the best? Our work ethic, the way we go to work and work at our job or school or whatever it may be, is God getting your best or is he getting the leftovers? I'll just do what it takes to get by. How about in the church, working in the church, and you have opportunity to do something in the church, is God getting the best from you when you teach, when you help, when you pray, whatever you might be doing, when you come and, and shovel snow? Is God getting the best out of you? Or is it just left over? I'm going to spend my best in the world. The church is last. What about your gifts and talents? Is God getting the best of your gifts and your talents? Or is he getting the leftovers? Abel gave the best of what he had. Cain offered of the fruit of the ground. Now you can't get blood out of a turnip or any other fruit. Cain's worship was unacceptable. Cain's anger and his countenance was a dead giveaway to his sinful attitude. Cain could have taken God's divine disapproval of his offering as this gracious communication that it was and humbly asked God for forgiveness, promising never to do it again. But he did not do that. We see that God gently responded to Cain's anger in verses 6 and 7. Let's read those. Verses 6 and 7, God gently responds to Cain's anger. He says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Now the questions here are rhetorical. God knows the answer. God asks simply to force Cain to face his sin. Cain was so angry at Abel that he couldn't face his own personal failure. God's offer, I believe here, is genuine to Cain. If Cain would do right and offer the right sacrifice in the right spirit, he too would have been accepted. The door was open for both brothers, but it must be entered by faith. The phrase, sin is crouching at the door, gives us this picture uh, of a lion waiting to crouch and pounce upon upon Cain and destroy him. What started as sibling jealousy led to anger. 
If Cain's not careful here, sin will overcome him and will master him. He's on the brink of destruction and God warns him so that he can go in another direction. There's a battle for his soul and right now sin has this upper hand on him. But there's still time to change. What will Cain do? Will he realize his danger and turn from his anger before it destroys him? The answer is quick and coming. Next, I want you to notice the murder. So Cain murders here. Look at verse 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Cain rejected God's wisdom to do what was right so that he could be accepted. He refused to repent, and the sin was crouching at his door, and it pounced upon him like a lion would pounce. Cain lures his brother out into a field. How did Cain approach Abel as a murderer? No. He approached him as a brother. Let's go out to the field. It's the language of brothers. Abel trusted his brother, and he went with him. Do you see Cain's strategy here? The murder was premeditated. His voice was the voice of of a brother, but his heart was the heart of a murderer. There was a surprise attack upon Abel. Maybe it was done with a club. Maybe it was done with Abel's sacrificial knife. There was certainly blood. After the first blow, maybe there was a cry of surprise. The question why. The fear, the shout for help, but there was none that was coming. The awful pain, the increasing darkness as the blows continue, and finally, death. It started with the suggestion, let's go out to the fields, and it ends with murder. The first murder was murder in the first degree. It was not a beating that went too far. It was not an accident. It was not self-defense. It was not a sudden flare-up of a temper. It was not retaliation. It was all planned carefully. It was deliberate, premeditated murder. Why? Because Cain hated Abel. Yes, but also, no. It was also a hatred of God. He wanted to remove his competition and he wanted to get even with God. And the only way to quote unquote get even or hurt God was to kill the man whose offering he accepted. Now the majority of murders are committed within the family, how easy it is to hurt those that we love. No one can make us as angry as those that are closest to us. The meanest things we say are often reserved for those closest to us. We often show kindness to people we hardly know while we're treating our family as if they were the scum of the earth. Think of it. One minute you're making an offering to God, And the next minute, you're killing your flesh and blood. There's a little Cain in all of us. There's a lot of Cain in most of us. Remember that God himself had spoken to Cain personally. The Lord had spoken to him personally. He had spoken to him clearly and lovingly and personally. And still he went out from the meeting with God and murdered his brother. So we see the murder of Cain to Abel. Next, let's see the Lord confront, confront Cain. He's going to confront Cain over this murder. So look at verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now, after this dastardly murder God in his mercy didn't confront Cain with a sword of judgment, but with words. The Lord spoke to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? God wants to talk to Cain about what's happened, but it's the last thing that Cain wants to talk about. Notice that God was immediately on the spot, just like he had been when Adam and Eve sinned against God, and they were in the garden hiding. Remember, he was right there almost immediately. Same thing here when God challenged Adam. Adam told the truth, if not the whole truth. But when Cain is challenged, he tells an outright lie. Where is your brother? I don't know. We all know where Abel was. Cain knew where Abel was. 
And God knew where he was as well. It wasn't information that God was seeking here. It was conviction and confession. Abel was lying in a field. There's a total denial of responsibility. Cain lies to God and then he denies that it should even matter. Then he made this callous, flippant remark. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain's flippant, indifferent reference to his dead brother revealed a heart hardened with depravity. Where's your brother? I don't know. He pled ignorance. But don't say to God, I don't know. God knows everything. He knows all things. And for Cain to think he could hide this from God, don't say to God, I don't know. We all know far more than we're prepared to acknowledge. What have you done in verse 10? God's working again for conviction and confession. He asked him, what have you done to give him an opportunity to confess? Let me say here that one son is dead and the other is murdered. So the seed of the serpent is quickly striking at the seed of the woman, trying to cut off the seed that would crush his head. So we have one son here that's murdered and the other one a murderer at this point. So the serpent is striking at the seed of the woman. God says, Cain, you can't deceive me. You can't hide anything from me. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now this is a figure of speech to indicate that Abel's death was well known to God. Abel's blood was crying out, vindicate me. So Cain has murdered his brother. God has confronted him. And next I want you to notice the curse on Cain. There is a curse that comes on Cain because of this terrible murder. Look at verses 11 and 12. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain is now put under God's curse. The ground, because of Cain, is also under a curse. Now, Cain was a farmer whose one vocation was to produce crops, but the ground was under a curse at this point. Cain would continue to work this ground, but it will no longer yield its fruit to him. Instead, the ground he works will produce weeds, it will produce thorns, there will not be the rains that he needs. Cain faced an appalling future of barrenness, of pain, of despair, of frustration, and finally death, as do all those who defy God. Cain would be a fugitive. He would be on the run all of his life, fearful that someone would try to take revenge on him for Abel's death. All of his life he was looking over his shoulder. He would live in constant fear. Cain would be a vagabond. He would be a wanderer, moving from place to place, drifting from place to place, never having a place to call his home. Cain was hidden from God's presence. He would no longer have the Lord to turn to. There was no coming to the Lord at this point. And I want you to notice the coldness or the pitilessness of Cain. He has murdered his brother. There is a curse now on him and the land. And I want you to see the coldness or the pitilessness of Cain. Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Now let's stop right there. Can you imagine that? He has just murdered his brother. He knows that God knows that he murdered his brother. And how dare him say, my punishment is more than I can bear. It's not, I'm sorry, I can't believe what I did, and tears flowing, falling to his knees. God, could you bring Abel back? That's not what he says. He says, my punishment is worse than I can bear. See the selfishness of Cain. It's all about Cain and his fears. I, me, my. The man who killed his brother cares only for himself. He doesn't express even the tiniest twinge of remorse of contrition, of repentance. If he feels bad about what happened, he doesn't show it at all. He hides it well. His only is concern, his only concern is that someone might kill him. And of course, if you've done something like that and you know that you're wrong, that's the first thing you think should happen to you is someone should take my life because I took someone else's. 
that's not Cain's attitude. He's worried about his punishment. That the, the land is not going to produce fruit like it did before. He's worried about himself. Finally, I want you to notice the compassion and the kindness of God. Even for someone as wicked as Cain, notice the compassion and the kindness of God. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. God promises protection amid punishment. No one will be able to touch Cain without facing sevenfold vengeance from the Lord. Now, whatever the mark was, it guaranteed Cain a long life. This is both a blessing, but hear this, but also a curse. It's a blessing that he's going to live a long life. No one can kill him, but it's also a curse. It's a blessing in that no one will kill him. It's a curse in that he will now live a long, restless life unfulfilled life his life would end like a man with no country this was the judgment Cain received was it not just it perfectly fit Cain's guilt for taking away the life of his kid brother it was a perfect judgment righteous in its every detail lasting his entire life the judge of all the earth he does right and he will do right when he judges you and I as well the blood of Abel spoke to God, but there's another's blood that speaks to God as well. It is also the blood of a murdered man, but one utterly innocent, wrongly condemned by men, one without spot or blemish. It is the blood of, as it says in Hebrews, Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Doesn't the death of Jesus speak to you? Doesn't the death of Jesus speak to you? If, you? if you were to see your child covered in blood, wouldn't that sight cry out to you? Never did any father love his son as much as God loved Jesus. And one day he saw Jesus with blood flowing from his head and his feet and his side. He was the Lamb of God, laying down His life and taking away the sin of the world. What was the blood saying to the Father? Can you be indifferent like Cain to this blood? Abel's blood called for vengeance, but Jesus' blood cries, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We are forgiven through the blood of Christ. You might have noticed this morning before us, we have the Lord's table the Lord's Supper, and this speaks of the blood, the blood that flowed at Calvary, that beautiful blood that washes away my sin, the reason that I'm forgiven. I can cast my cares, I can cast my sin upon Christ Jesus and the blood that flowed at Calvary, and I am forgiven for it. Isn't that beautiful? Abel died, and he was a type. We can look at that and see kind of a type of righteousness and death, but nothing like the Christ. Pointing forward to the Christ who gave his life for you and I. If you will just believe that God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believe upon him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you will believe upon this crucified Christ in your place, that he took all of the wrath of God for you. He took your sin and he gave up his life at the cross. If you will believe that, you will be saved. You won't be in the order of Cain. Cain, a damned man. But you'll be a man of faith, a man of righteousness, like the man that was killed, Abel, forgiven. Now, this morning again, we have the Lord's Supper before us. We are remembering the death of our precious Savior. And I'm going to flip over in my Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to read you just a few verses here for a moment. 
Paul says this, and he's talking to the church at Corinth, and he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a wonderful time we have this morning to remember that death of our Savior. How precious it is. But I have to go a little further because I'd be amiss if I stopped right there because a dead Savior with no resurrection is a dead Savior. But because of that third day when Christ was resurrected, And as King, as Lord, as Master, because of that, that makes this table all the more special. We were on a plane on the way home from Florida, and we were sitting next to a man, and Corey was in between myself and him, and she kind of worked up a conversation with this man. They were talking about different things, and he was reading a book, and the book was really to do with evolution. And so they started talking, and... And he just began to say that he didn't believe the Bible, didn't believe in God, didn't believe in the six days of creation, what we've been studying, didn't believe those things. And so Corey talked to him and and asked him some questions, did a wonderful job of of just pointing some things out in a wonderful way, you know, no, no anger, nobody upset or anything like that. But I had an opportunity at one point to point something out because he He's talking about religions, and he started going off on religions, saying they're all the same. And I said, well, no, they're not. The difference in us who are Christians is we have a resurrected Lord. Over 500 people saw him after his resurrection, so we know that he was resurrected. He is king, he is Lord, he is master. And that's what makes all of this so very important. Because we can know that we know that we know that God exists. His son died for us. He was resurrected. He can save us from our sins. He can save us from an eternity damned. That's awesome. That is awesome. So this is special this morning. I'm going to ask you this time if Larry and Bill would come forward. We're going to pass out the bread first and then the juice. But before we do, let me say a couple of things. Paul gives us some warnings. Obviously, if you're not a believer, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I don't even think Paul doesn't deal with that here. He doesn't need to. That's obvious. Then this table's not for you. You need to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then you can partake of this meal, remembering his death for you. But also, if you're a believer... A born-again believer who's trusted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you have your open sin in your life that you're not willing to repent of. You say, hey, I love it too much. I'm not going to repent of it. I'm not going to confess it and get it right. And I'd say, let it pass by. It's kind of the feeling you get from 1 Corinthians 11, that they were living in sin and partaking in an unworthy manner, and judgment fell upon them. It talks about them falling asleep, which means death. They were dying. Some of them them were getting sick. Some of them were dying because they were partaking of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. And obviously, obviously the significance of this table is so important that we want to take in a worthy manner. But let me say this. If you're like me, a sinner saved by the grace of God who struggles with sin every day of my life, having to confess every moment, every day of my life, I'm having to confess sin. This table's for you. It's for us, sinners saved by the grace of God. So let us pray, and then we'll pass out the bread first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this table that means so much to us who are believers, that we remember the awful, terrible, horrendous death of your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, as we remember that, we remember how blessed we are to receive that grace, that mercy from you. 
And God, if there's anything in my life right now, anything in our lives that, that is not what it should be, that we might take of this table in an, in an unworthy manner, Lord, forgive us right now, cleanse us, make us ready to take in a way that we remember the death of Christ in a proper way. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim the Lord's death. Now receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, 
according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here today.